Here we are in New York City to talk about another architectural phenomenon. Unlike the previous episode about those parking garages with green space on top of them that are cropping up in cities around the world, this is a little more um, endemic to New York. Although as we're about to see, it is emblematic of a deeper issue across the United States at the very least. What I want to talk about is the pencil tower. A pencil tower is a super tall, super slender skyscraper with an aspect ratio of greater than 1 to 10. As opposed to early groundbreaking skyscrapers, these are primarily residential, and they contain usually as little as two or one housing unit per floor at some of the highest dollar per square foot prices in the world. In addition to providing a literal bird's eye view of the city, the majority of the condominiums in these towers are foreign owned and the majority of them are uninhabited most of the year. Unfortunately, market forces backed by the state have decided that a forest of hollow elevator shafts blighting a historic skyline is the best way to distribute resources. Quick xenophobia disclaimer. The problem with this investment model is that the people who own the residences don't live there. It's not because they're foreign. It's because they don't live in the units they buy and so they don't contribute to taxes. Okay, back to the story. The pencil tower was set in motion over a hundred years ago, in 1916, when the largest office building in the world was the Equitable Building. 40 stories tall on a one acre plot in lower Manhattan. Its capital H shape gives the illusion of two towers growing out of a single podium, but at street level it is essentially its entire acre plot extruded 40 times upward. Seems great, right? The marvels of modern engineering allow for the surface area of an acre of urban land to be stacked 40 times on top of itself. This is the type of innovation I was promised when I signed up for capitalism. Unfortunately, this building casts a very sinister seven acre shadow over its neighbors, which among other things harmed the property values of nearby real estate. So these developers banded together in a push for regulation. Yes, I too was shocked to hear that ruling class capitalists, despite continuously appealing to notions of individual freedom, personal responsibility, and laissez-faire economics, will clamor for big government intervention as soon as their bottom line is threatened. And so the government intervened and passed the 1916 zoning resolution, which said that if you want to build a certain height, you had to do a setback, and if you wanted to go above that height, you had to do another setback, and so on. And soon every building in Manhattan was shaped like a wedding cake. Until the 1950s, when an architect named Ludwig Mies van der Rohe, who had fled Germany because the Gestapo shut down his architecture school, because modernism was incompatible with Nazism, popularized a new style of building, the slab. The 1916 zoning code said that the less of your plot you use, the higher you can build a concept that you may know as floor area ratio. I'm not sure why it took 30 years for developers to take advantage of this, but the 1951 Lever House and the 1958 Seagram building led to a new zoning resolution in 1961, which added height bonuses for adding public spaces. These resolutions also added some level of protections for residential neighborhoods and historic buildings and required parking to be included in many new developments in an attempt to combat the city's growing density and general feeling of urban swampiness. The Lever House was one of the first skyscrapers to have air conditioning, and to keep costs down, its curtain wall windows were designed not to be operable. The building is a hermetically sealed work environment where you can pack workers into every square inch of the floor plan because they would no longer overheat if they strayed too far from a window. The Seagram building's symmetrical layout of columns and transparent windows communicates very clearly what type of activity is going on inside and how exactly it is portioned up. Which is funny because Seagram is a liquor company that came to prominence during Prohibition. This building looks black, but its outer frame is cast in bronze. It's got 60 years of patina on it, so it's seasoned like a nice cast iron griddle. And soon, everything in Manhattan from then on was shaped roughly like the thing from 2001 with a privately owned park next to it or inside of it, including the early 80s Trump Tower with some very hidden, nominally public gardens where you can go and get accosted by the Secret Service for free. 
Now, because capitalism is always craving new markets, a growing class of global elite has created demand for $250 million penthouses a mile above the street that they can visit a few times a year when they're bored with their main house in Monaco. After decades of building up and up and up, developers invoked the most sinister piece of the zoning code, air rights. If you don't use all your zoning envelope, like if you have a relatively short building like a museum or a church or just another skyscraper, you can sell the remaining potential surface area to nearby lots. This secondary market, combined with advancements in engineering in the 2010s, created a surge in impossibly tall and petite towers. This is 200 Amsterdam in the Upper West Side. To achieve its 200 meter height, it gerrymandered a lot with 39 sides from neighboring properties, inaccessible parking spaces, and driveways. This is 432 Park Avenue. More than a fifth of its 425 meter height is reserved for mechanical use because mechanical spaces don't count towards floor area ratio. This is 100 East 53rd, where developers merged two plots to reach the 217 meter height, transferring over 200,000 square feet of airspace from the Seacrum building itself next door. This is 157, which earned its height as a result of underwriting some affordable units in the Bronx at a production cost of five times what it takes to actually build an affordable housing unit, producing 66 units instead of 370. It received a $65 million tax break to do this. This is Steinway Tower. It will be 400. Oh, hold up. I like this part. It will be 438 meters tall and the thinnest residential building in the world with an aspect ratio of 1 to 24. Its developers contributed $9 million to the Affordable Housing Fund in exchange for a bonus of 20,000 square feet. Its condos are expected to sell at 20 to $60 million each. And this is Central Park Tower, which is about to be the tallest residential building in the world. It snagged 90,000 square feet, or nearly 10% of its total square footage, by purchasing an affordable housing scheme from another development group. I couldn't track down exactly what that scheme was, but hey, maybe this is the one time it'll serve the interest of the public good. These towers are built on loopholes. The air rights market is lucrative, its public records are inscrutable, and there's no mechanism to trigger public review despite the impact these buildings have on the market and the environment. The bonuses granted by paying into affordable housing funds or even developing affordable housing are skewed wildly in favor of developers because New York's affordable housing program is a joke. Eligibility is based on the AMI of the entire city and surrounding wealthy suburbs, which means that affordable units often go to upper middle class families or that they don't even get built because the tax abatements they provide are not tracked and there's nothing to stop developers from double dipping or using one project subsidy multiple times. This is projected to cost the city almost one and a half billion dollars a year in revenue and put several times that much in the pockets of the already filthy rich. So it's clearly not about density because the original zoning resolution accommodated a projected population of 55 million people in Manhattan. And it's not about free market efficiency because, as usual, the state has intervened throughout this process to protect the interests of investors and developers. To quote our friend Rem Coolhouse, beyond a certain critical mass, each structure becomes a monument, or at least raises that expectation through its size alone. It merely is itself and through sheer volume cannot avoid being a symbol celebrating only the fact of its disproportionate existence, the shamelessness of its own process of creation. A lot of these projects are either recently completed or starting construction at the time of this recording. Many of them still exist only in render form online. There have been some recent roadblocks, like a lawsuit putting a freeze on the gerrymander to 200 Amsterdam building, and a bunch of groups like the Municipal Art Society and Friends of the Upper East Side are working hard to advocate policies that protect the skyline, 
protect the precious remaining urban sunlight in New York and drive housing costs back down. But rest assured, the machine that makes these pencil towers is churning more rapidly every day. So let me know what kind of monuments to inequality have been built in your city, or what your city has done to fend off skyrocketing housing costs, or if you just think free housing is cool. Or if you live in Hong Kong, which is practically made up of these towers, the reasons for which we can talk about some other time. But as you might guess, it has mostly to do with colonialism. I want to say thanks to the folks on Twitter who chimed in to shower me in New York fun facts like there was almost an elevated airport in Queens, it's faster to walk across Manhattan than drive, and it's bad. And a major thank you to the people on Patreon for your support. It really goes a long way every time someone agrees to throw a buck or two my way, and I hope to continue to earn your support by creating more stuff. All right, thanks for watching. <laughs>